you for more of why boom but this is you know you 100 or so the fame and you are on the two yes a special interview right here on the, the station my name is jimmy jackson and i'll be uh, the host uh, for today's uh, interview in the studio uh, we are actually playing host uh, to uh, a professor of uh, development uh, communication yes in the faculty of arts uh, University of Iyo, in the person of um, uh, Professor Ashonga C. Ashong. Uh, Professor Ashonga holds a BA English education uh, from the University of Calabar, uh, ME, uh, Communication Arts, University of Ibadan, PhD in uh, Communication Arts, University of Ibadan, and also is a former ASU chairman at University of Rio, a former member of the Governing Council, University of Rio, a former head of department, uh, former, uh, yes, head of department, communication arts, a former member of appointments and uh, promotion committee, academic at uh, University of Rio, a former chairman of Victory Chapel at uh, University of Rio, a chairman, board of trustees, God's ambassador church, uh, Church of God Mission in Yo member of the Board of uh, Governors, the Redemption Academy in Yo Kwaibom State. He's a father, uh, no, he's also yeah. married to Reverend uh, Mrs. Angela Ashong. He's here with us uh, today in the studio, and yes, he'll be talking to us. So, good morning, Professor Ashong, and welcome to Yo 100 to Seven Fame. Thank you very much. Good morning, and uh, I'm glad to be here. Okay. All right, uh, Prof, um, I just rolled out your your profile right there. So let's let's start with that. Um, and let's get to know a little bit more about you, where you're from, and uh, as, as, as small, a bit of your this beloved wife. She is late now, although my mother is still alive. The third in a series of nine children, first son, uh, and... Uh, I started primary school at age five, at a time when most people didn't go to school that early. Mm -hmm. Went to secondary school um, by my 12th birthday and uh, continued that way through the university until I got here in 1985 as a teaching assistant or what we call today graduate assistant. Okay. And moved through the ranks until I became professor mm. in 2016. So, okay. I don't know what else you want to know. But okay, but, but uh, uh, thank you for that. But quickly, uh, let's look at the challenges uh, you had to you know, endure to get to this point in your life. Um, first of all, as I said, uh, my father was a reverend gentleman, mm. very small income he had, but a man who believed very much in education. And I remember him telling me time and again that even if he had money to build me skyscrapers, he would not really consider that his priority okay. because, according to him, when he left, somebody stronger than me could seize them from him. Okay. But that if he gave me a good education, he was sure that nobody would be able to take that from me. And with it, I could become whatever I wanted to be in life. Okay. Uh, so the first challenge I had was, number one, that... Uh, resources were limited, and there was a large family, as I said, I was the third in a series of nine okay. children, so the resources were limited. One had to go to school on very small means, mm. and I remember how difficult it was for my father to be convinced when, in 1982, I said to him, I was in year three then, uh, my younger brother, my immediate younger brother, who unfortunately is late now, okay. had been admission to read law. I think he, he had really desired over the years, and I came home happy to announce the news, only to have my father say, um, son, it's good news, but you must wait until you graduate. Mm. Well, I said, no, he, he can't wait. He has to come with me now. And my father said, sorry, I thought you knew that my resources were very lean. And I said to him, sorry, Father, I know that your resources are lean. I have thought through it. I have decided in advance. You don't need to ask. I'm going to try to convince my younger brother. First of all, we are not going to do uh, living the same lifestyles as we see other people living. We are not going to 
at best they will take two meals in a day. If we must, we will take one, and uh, we will uh, limit our needs to just our uh, transportation. One meal at uh, at most or two in a day, and uh, we won't even go for textbooks. We'll use the library. And by the time I spelled it out for him, mm. he he still wasn't convinced initially. Okay. And I remember having to threaten him for the first time in my life. You threatened your father? Yes, I threatened him. Was that common back then? No, it was not. I never answered back when he spoke. Mm. That it wasn't the, the, the vogue then. Mm. And that was, I, I had to use that rare technique because I knew I had to shock him okay. into realization. Mm. Uh, when I threatened, this was a Wednesday, and I said to him, Papa, as I used to call him then, okay. it wasn't the days of daddy. I'll be going back to Calabar on Saturday. It's up to you to decide what I do thereafter. Mm. If I go with my younger brother, it will be fine. But if I go back alone, expect me back on Sunday. Mm. I'll come back with everything I have in school. It's either we are both going or nobody is going. Okay. And then he said, Pardon him. I said, well, I'm sorry, but these are the hard facts. I know it's expensive. I know it's difficult for you. But I also know that it's going to get costlier in future. It won't get any cheaper. Mm. Secondly, much as I love you very much, I cannot tell how much more time you have left. So imagine that I graduate alone mm. and you leave by leaving and then dying. Okay. Uh, that would leave me alone to handle all these responsibilities that you have. Okay. And I will have to raise my own family in addition to all that. Mm. That load will be too much for me alone. So I'll need help. Thirdly, um, the truth of the matter is that admission is not just there for the taking. Okay. He had tried this thing earlier and he wasn't getting it. This year that he has, we can't let it go. Okay. So we just have to take what we have now. All right. So eventually he had to agree with me. Okay. Now that's one challenge that I had. I told you that there were several people. Several. So there were many people. Okay. And just as I said, unfortunately, that my younger brother graduated in 1986. My father died in 1990. Mm. So he didn't have so much time left. I and today, the good news is that as I speak, my youngest brother is doing a PhD. In Everybody, law. no, not in law. That one that okay, I okay. talked about was my immediate younger brother. Okay, immediate, he right. died. All right. Uh, but the very last of them, who is 19 years younger than I am, mm. is doing a PhD in law. Okay. Sorry, not in law, in geology. In geology. All right, uh, Prof. We'll come back uh, to talk about that. But l let's look at your family, uh, your family life. Let's talk about your wife. Uh, she is a reverend. Uh, a, known reverend in the state uh, but let's quickly talk about your family life uh, before we uh, dwell into what we have to discuss today well family life you mean my nuclear yeah, family yes well i'm married to one wife okay who is a woman mm. uh, we have two biological children okay uh, a boy well should i call him a boy the man now, the man now. is he married i'm not married yet well, uh, that's very private, uh, because each time I talk to him about being married, he says he's got to settle down properly. Mm. He doesn't want to have to everything in the world. Or? Not everything in the world. He, he wants to be able to run his affairs without reference to me. Okay. He doesn't want to ask me for anything when he needs whatever. I respect his wishes, so I, I'm not pressing too hard, but I keep nudging at him. Okay. And uh, I hope he does not threaten you as you should. No. Well. No, you know, I, I told you I never spoke back when my father talked. Okay. I had to resort to that very rare technique of threatening him okay. because I knew the essence of that, what I was asking for. Mm. And I remember I also said that he believed very much in education, okay. which is why I started primary school at five at a time when most people started at seven or eight, okay. which is why... Because I, of touching the... Exactly. Yeah. And that's one, I, I, I thought I should reserve that one for the inaugural lecture. Okay. <laughs> that, that thing about touching the ear, my father had to teach me a technique. Okay, you touch To touch the ear, uh, you know, I had to, do I say cheat? 
Oh. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate it at the lecture. Okay. I had to talk my ear in a manner that uh, made them accept me, mm. even though I was on the age at oh. that time. Oh. But then, somehow, I swam through school. Okay. So back to my family, as I said, I have two biological children, a boy and a girl. The boy uh, has a master's in the information technology management, okay. uh, lives in the U.S. now. Mm. The girl ha is uh, a lawyer, just got called to the bar last month. Okay. And she's not married also? She's not married also. Okay. She too, you know, has her own ideas about uh, marriage getting married. But, but, uh, it's not as if they don't want to marry. Okay. Okay. I remember her saying that her mate was distributing uh, invitation to marry her, and she screamed and said, where is she rushing to? Where is she hurrying to? And all that. But it's okay. Mm. All right. Uh, before we move away, I'm quite interested because um, I'm actually young, so maybe I could glean from your wealth of experience when it has to do with um, your children, two of them, both not mine. Uh, but do you feel any sense of pressure or any sort of pressure uh, with them? And looking at when you guys at of your time, are you a little bit worried looking no, at the society? I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not worried mm. because I believe that certain very important decisions must be left to the individual to take. Oh. For instance, getting married, I, I had warned my parents that they had better be ready for whoever I brought to them mm. because I wasn't going to be caged into, nobody should draw a map for me and say marry from this area or from that area. Okay. I wanted the world. Mm. And uh, they were very wonderful people. I, well, when I want to talk about them, I really don't know whether to use where or are ah, because my father is late, my mother is alive. Okay. So when I talk to both about both of them at the same time, I don't, friends, which, both. I don't know which one to, to use. Mm. Uh, but they, they, they understood my inclinations. Okay. They understood that I was responsible enough to make my own decisions. So the day I brought my wife, then on, uh, my fiancée, to show to them, my father shocked me. He, he used to be extremely meticulous, very questioning, he, critical of everything, and he would ask you such penetrating questions. If you were not ready for it, he, he would be in trouble. But he just, I just said, Papa, this is the young lady I'd like to settle down with. He didn't ask me one question. Mm. He just opened his arms to her and said, my daughter, welcome home. Mm. And that broke my wife like nothing else ever. She, she felt so accepted, so loved that she committed herself to the family and it shows till today. Okay. All right. Um, for, before we move away from family life, let's let's quickly talk about how you met your wife. Because it's, it's a story <laughs> that, you know, at least I've heard somewhere. It looks like you know something about it. That's why you are <laughs> Yeah. Well, my wife was my student. Mm. I taught her at the time when I first came, I used to teach use of English. Mm general things, which was very useful to me because I got to know so many people. Till today, I meet people who would tell me, you taught me, and I looked at them and said, I don't remember, and they said, of course, there were many, and uh, very many indeed, okay. and I'm very proud of many of them, okay. wherever they are. Even yesterday, I met a, a commissioner who announced to everybody that I taught her when she was in year one, and quite frankly, I don't know. But I know they are telling the truth. Mm. So uh, she was in my class, and uh, I don't know how the, the details of how it all started, but I know that I piqued interest in her. As, as your student? Well, she was my student, but when I decided that she was good enough to be my wife, she had ceased being my fiance. I said it was a okay, year she one. has ceased being your student. Yes, it, it was a year one course. Okay. And you know, but before she left I had, you know, okay started. To her. Okay, started. But but I, why I'm asking this question because um uh it's quite interesting and let's get to understand this sort of relationship which um, some of some people have the opinion that she, this should not be condoled in artificial institution and you have a case of a similar one. So I I I'm 
that particular about it, and that's what I'm asking. I understand. Yeah. You know, I know that the people who talk about harassment mm. talk about uh, say that it is unethical for a lecturer to ever have any feelings for the students. I don't think that they are being human. Oh. Truth of the matter is this. It would be wrong for a lecturer to take advantage of his students. Okay. But you cannot say that simply because this one is a student and the other one is a lecturer that they are no longer human oh. and that they could not have mutual feelings for each other, each other. which could be domesticated properly. Mm. I think the quarrel should be with how one goes about it. When I decided that this one was one I was interested in, I talked to her and allowed her all the time she wanted in the world to take her decision. And because both she and I are strong believers in God, we took it to God in prayer, independently. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was taking her a long time. And thank God that God loved me much to go to her and say to her, why are you torturing my son? Mm -hmm. He's been waiting for an answer. Go give him an answer. Okay. And then she came back and said, okay, it is fine by her. Now, remember I said I taught my year one. Mm. When did we get married? My final year. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, if you're just joining us, this is Unio 100.7 FM, and I have in the studio Professor Ashong Gansi Ashong uh, right here. He's here to talk to us, and uh, we dived a bit away from why he's here uh, to talk to us. Um, at the University of Rio, yes, we'll be having uh, her. 83rd annual lecture and yes uh, the uh, prof who would be lecturing on that particular day is ready for he's right here with us uh professor ashon and uh, yes we talked about him the family life and all of that but let's quickly come back to look at the education uh prof uh, let's, uh i actually earlier ruled out your uh, your you know progress to attend uh, of attaining these um, these statues, let's let's look at it. Um, what informed that drive and the cause of study? Two things. Mm. First of all, you remember me telling you that my father was a great lover of education. education. So that's like family. Yes. Okay. Uh, the man. I, I mean, he he kept telling me that. The things he couldn't do as a man, he thought I should do. Mm. And one of them was having a good education. Okay. In 1983, while he and I were seated in a parlor listening to radio, the Cross River Radio then, I don't know what happens now, mm. used to have a litany of uh, obituaries. And they will read this person is dead and will be buried on so 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 he survived by blah 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 long list almost always and there was this particular one i don't remember anything about who was involved but when they were reading the survivors there was a long list of doctor this doctor that doctor this mm. doctor that and my father just turned to me and said son you must get that title oh. and i was a year three student an undergraduate so that sowed the seed of, of drive ambition to become an academic because i knew that getting to phd uh, it wasn't going to be uh, not too many other jobs were available mm. so you had to be an academic so it's so that at that time the jobs not available in nigeria or no jobs will be available but for phds you know most people will look at you and say ah, that is the university thing at least then but maybe it's not the same story today but most phds were found in the university of Madras. Mm. so that was the first thing that sold that seed in me and then of course i realized when i went to school that there were many of these professors of mine whom i admired you know they came to class they taught as if it was part of their breathing in and breathing out. It was just second nature, as it were. And they, they, they had such facility and such expression that I admired listening to them. I remember 
Dr. Mrs. Emilia Oku. Uh, you ask her a question. She's part of the African novel. Uh, African novel, yes. Uh, you ask her a question on one novel, and by the time she's finished talking, she has referred to 10, 15 others. Okay. And the way she used to link them, and the more she spoke, it was as if she was getting charged. And I, I got excited about it. Professor Uno, late now, was another person who excited me about, you know, it was so soft-spoken, so gentle, but he would tell you the things you wanted to know about his program. And then we had this visitor from uh, Unila, Professor Adetugo, uh, uh, and he taught us stylistics. And the man, he was a chain smoker, he would stand at the door, finish his cigarette, or at least do a good bit of it. And then as he snuffed it out, he, he walked in talking the, the, the thing that he, he came to talk about. Mm. I got excited at all of that. And I decided, oh, it looks like this was the kind of thing I wanted to do. Okay. And uh, why this course? Okay. I remember the first degree was in English. Yeah, English. And you moved, switched moved to, to communication. communication. Oh, the reason was this. Not that I wasn't enjoying the stuff I was doing in English. Uh, by the way, Unilag offered me admission to do master's in, in, in English. Okay. UI offered me admission. And mm -hmm. I chose to go to UI because okay. I saw... Was it because of the prestige of the no, university? No, no, no. no, no. Unilag was as prestigious. Okay. Uh, it has always been. Okay. But UI was going to give me a chance to go into communication. Mm -hmm. Why did I prefer communication? As a younger person, I used to enjoy listening to radio and watching people on television. I liked listening to people who had a good accent, who spoke English with a fluency and a facility that looked as if it was native to them. Mm. And I thought I wanted to be like that. Okay. I wanted to be a broadcaster. Mm. But then fate had it that, well, do I say fate? God led me to being a teacher instead. Mm. And I saw I was enjoying the teaching than broadcasting? Not necessarily, mm. but at least I didn't have an experience in broadcasting, so I couldn't compare. Oh, but okay. I was engaged with teaching, and I was beginning to enjoy it. Mm. I loved coming to class, you know, in those early days, I really prepared like those my teachers, and very often coming without any notes, and, uh, you know, Taking my each time I could take my class for one hour from start to finish without having to stammer at any point in time mm. with, and being able to explain things. I enjoyed having students ask questions, even challenging questions, because I did it as an undergraduate. Okay. We used to read ahead of time and we would come with questions prepared to, you know, challenge our teachers. Mm. And those whose classes I enjoyed most were those who allowed us to ask those challenging questions. Okay. and who, you know, put us where we belonged. We thought we knew a lot, mm. but by the time they finished answering the questions, we knew we had to start. Okay. So I enjoyed that. Mm. So I told myself I wanted to be like that. So, and I found that I was beginning to enjoy this part. So I said, well, if I can't be a broadcaster, I can produce broadcasters. Mm. So that's why I decided to study communication. Okay, at your master's and PhD level. But um, I'm still staying with education. Let's quickly look at um, uh, maybe your thesis, because maybe this might have started when you did your master's, your thesis and master's, which is um, a development uh, communication. Uh, why did you choose that particular path in communication? Um, again, I had a teacher in 19... 79, 80 or thereabout, okay. a Briton, uh, the name used to be David Pallet. I don't know why, I have not had contact with him in these 40 odd years or more. So I can't tell whether he's alive or not. Okay. But this man came to class one day, he was a philosopher, and he said he wanted to define the word development mm. and it took him all the whole hour trying to define development and I got interested okay and uh, 
asked him a series of questions and he answered all of them as if he came prepared for me. And from that day, I, everything about development began to interest me because I saw that some people use the word in a negative sense, mm. some use it in a positive sense. And the question was, is everything people call development, development for you? Mm. And I got interested. Okay. And as I went on, I got more interested in development because I saw that, let me give you one example. In this present age, you talked about youthful people. As a, a baby, I enjoyed sucking my mother's breast for over one year. And so did all my siblings. And uh, I found that that is the best thing to do, actually, mm. for a growing child. But we now have people in this age who have children, and from day one almost, they give them the feeding bottle. Okay. Which was not prevalent back then. No, I didn't taste anything, not even water, till I was six months. Okay. Nothing outside breast milk. Mm. And that my mother did for all of us, nine of us, as I said earlier. And it shows today how healthy we are. All my siblings, all of them, okay. to a man, they're all very healthy people. And I realized that it is because of that foundation. And I, I discovered that people who do this feeding bottle thing think that they are modern. Mm. Meanwhile, they're not. Uh, I think that they have they, they have lost it. But don't you think that that's development for them? It, it is it is Progress. wrong to imagine that that is development if it does not add to the well being of the person. Mm. Okay. Breast milk certainly does better for a child than the bottle. Mm. And therefore, if you are taking something that is worse off than the one which is better and which is cheaper and which is safer, then you cannot call the outcome of it development. Mm. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, this is uh, Uni 107 FM, and we are um, still in the studio having uh, Professor Ashong right here talking to us um, about uh, developments, especially away communication. And uh, he has explained explicit um, what development and what, how and why he choose um, to deal and stay with uh, a development in communication at. Uh, Prof, uh, let's look at um, development, especially in the education sector. Uh, I know that uh, more will be dwelt on at the inaugural lecture, but let's look at development in the educational sector, especially with um, uh, I tertiary institution in Nigeria, government-owned tertiary institution. I want you to compare and contrast. Back then, when you were students of a tertiary institution in Nigeria, government-owned, and now, in terms of development. I, I, I wish I were not this involved. Mm. Each time I talk to my students about our undergraduate days, which we thought had begun to go down at the time. By the way, I got my first degree in 1984. Okay. Uh, when I talked to them about the kind of life we lived as undergraduates, they never accept that I'm talking about Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Number one, talking about our coastal environment, the fact that as an undergraduate, I never made my bed. I woke up and walked away. Somebody had a duty to clean the room and make my bed for me, yeah. drop toilet tissue when I needed, wash the bedding when they got dirty, mm. and on and on and on. That was in the hostel. If we went to the, we paid for one meal, we'll quickly pop up before I graduated. And that's because the Naira was very powerful. And in class, we had manageable classes. There were class general courses that were large, but by and large, for departmental courses, you never had to sit one on top of the other mm. or stand at the window and stuff like that. Facilities were a little better than they are today. Mm. Our lecturers were treated with some dignity, respected in society, and government related with them with some measure of honor. Mm. And because of all that, the lecturers also had an air about them 
and a disposition which said that certain things were beneath their dignity. Yeah. For instance, nobody compelled me to buy a book or give me trash in the name of handouts for exorbitant causes. Mm. The most I remember would be for our lecturers to hand us material and ask us to go reproduce them for ourselves, mm. which is what I do till today. Mm-hmm. If, you are, if, you, if you have the opportunity to ask my students, ask them. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what I believed to be uh, lecturing. Mm. And that's because uh, it appeared that a little more emphasis was made, particularly at the university level, than it is today. Mm. Public institutions were respectable. When I was an undergrad, well, before then, uh, let me talk about secondary school, for instance. I remember that when I was in secondary school, those of us in government secondary schools looked down on people who were in private institutions. Looked down. Looked down. I mm. insist. Looked down on them. But now the reverse is the case. The reverse is the case. Now, when I left secondary school in 1976, I toyed with the idea of going abroad. The reason I didn't go was that every mate of mine told me that that meant that I was not good enough to vie for admission in Nigeria. That's why I was looking for an easy way out to go abroad. And that stopped me. But today, it's a pride for people to be in private institutions or to study abroad. When we were secondary school children, we didn't have much regard for people who came from abroad. Well, if you came from Britain, maybe because we were just out of Britain, we we respected you. Mm. But outside that, came from America, came from India, and all of those other places, we looked down on you. But today, the reverse is the case. And what's the reason? Because, number one, government does not pay attention to education. Strikes have become frequent and prolonged. And uh, generally, people, even our society, does not have much value for education. We think the faster the pocket, the better it is. Lecturers are paid poorly, even though some people out there think they are paid very badly. And all of that put together has reshaped the policy of what the educational environment is like. So this has cut us very bad. Okay. All right, uh, Prof, uh, still staying with education because uh, I know that um, this is really, really important. Let's look at, because we're talking about development, uh, we'll go through to the theme of uh, the inaugural lecture. But let's look at development and let's look at um, someone going to school. The purpose is for development, you know, for a better future and looking at our youths right now but a lot of people have been of this theory that nigerian graduates especially in special institution now um are just graduates by people but there's nothing like human development you know what they say in learning and in character it's rare you see in a nigerian graduate as of today well i i, I don't think that it is fair to blame the university system alone for whatever the observations are. Mm. Truth of the matter is that society itself does not set much store by character and does not have much value for morals and morality. We respect people based on the size of their pockets. It's not with the university. The trouble is that the society does not have its value system right. And as long as the university is part of that society, you cannot expect it to be in isolation. So until we are able to focus, and it's one of the things I criticize in my lecture, which I won't go into, we should have a national philosophy which we we pursue very well. You hear people talk of the American dream. Mm -hmm. If it comes to communication, we are so libertarian in attitude. Mm -hmm. But in our own case, it's difficult to describe. And I won't go further than okay. that. Don't ask me more questions. Than that. <laughs> okay. Because we need to talk about that at the next one. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, yes. Uh, quickly. Um, hopefully, we'll try to see if we can open up our phone lines. But let's um, tell you that um, something will be happening in the University of Rio on Thursday, as the University of Rio will be having um, its uh, 83rd inaugural lecture. Uh, which, yes, we have uh, the lecturer of the department, um, 
I think the Department of Communication Arts Faculty of Arts University of Rio, uh, yes, who will be doing justice uh, to that particular inaugural lecture. And the theme for that inaugural lecture is uh, Men Streaming uh, Development Communication for National Development. And yes, that will be taking place at the 1000 CETA capacity uh, monitorium at the main campus of the University of Rio. And uh, the University of Rio community um, invites everyone, everyone to be part of uh, that particular inaugural lecture. But Prof, uh, quickly, um, the inaugural lecture, um, what are we to expect? Well, as you said, the topic is mainstreaming development communication for national development. Uh, we'll be talking about what constitutes national development. We'll be talking about what is development communication. We're talking about how to make it, you know, to extend focus on it, how to make it a mainstream uh, issue in our uh, national experience. Reason being very simple, that development is something that we all crave. And unfortunately, that you can't really have proper development unless it is accompanied by proper communication. Mm. Communication is a great facilitator. It has people to understand exactly what you, you, where you're heading and how you want to get there. And it helps you also to evaluate what you've done and things like that. We have details which I don't think is right to go into no. right now. Yeah. But that would be it. We'll be talking about making development communication more prominent than it is today. Uh, we'll say what our views are as to why it is the way it is. And we, I believe, as a person, that our development has been stunted and slow because we have not attached sufficient importance to development communication. So it will be my task to try and get us to understand how we can make it more prominent and to show us what we stand to gain mm. if we do that. Okay. All right, Prof, the time again for the you know, lecture. Time is 3 p.m. Okay, 3 p.m. Yes, then we'll be advisable to get there before 3 p.m. Okay, and with your face mask right there. Yes. Okay, um, yes, The this is um, to invite the general public uh, to attend uh, the inaugural lecture, which is on Thursday, uh, this week's Thursday, August 26, 2021, uh, 3 p.m. Uh, at the 1000 seater capacity auditorium right there at the main campus of the University of Rio. Uh, my name is Jimmy Jackson. I had the pleasure of hosting uh, the lecturer for that particular inaugural lecture in the person of uh, Professor Ashong C. Ashong, thank you, Prof, for coming around uh, to talk to us. Thank you, Jimmy, and thank you for listening. All right. We hope to see you there. Okay. All right. Uh, that's the way we have to call it a wrap for um, today's uh, special interview. Uh, the rest of the programs on Unity 100 for FM uh, would be continuing right here. My name is Jimmy Jackson. Go out for fun, please. Bye-bye.